Hello, and welcome back to Maya's Reviews, a podcast and blog where I review all types of movies and novels. I'm Maya, and thank you for joining me for a very special episode today. Not only is something very different, you can see my face, but it's also the 50th episode, and I did not really plan on showing my face, it just kind of happened, which is kind of weird. I hope the camera quality is not too horrible. I'm using a wide a webcam. Um, I don't know whether I will be showing my face as much in the future. I'll probably stick with my episodes still being faceless, but this is a very special episode because not only am I showing my face for the first time and it's the 50th episode, we've been here for 50 episodes, you guys, but I have a very special guest. I had the wonderful opportunity to interview Joyce Chopra, director of Smooth Talk, about her new memoir coming out November 22nd, 2022. I actually have a copy right here if I can find it somewhere in my bookshelf. Um, as you can see, I've gone, I've read this and I went through and I had little sticky notes. Um, this book is such a good book. Um, here's the cover. Hopefully there's not a glare. And it is not only super inspiring, but it is just such a good read, especially if you watched any of Joyce Chopra's films or documentaries or uh, TV movies, episodes, anything you've watched of her works. I highly recommend that you pre-order this book and read it. It is such a good book. And, you know, without further ado, here is my interview with Joyce Chopra. Was there a specific experience that made you realize you wanted to make films? It, it, it wasn't just one experience. It was it was sort of stage by stages. I I uh, I studied liter comparative literature, English and French in college, and uh, at that point I wanted to be an actress. That was my hope. I had acted in some high school plays, and I loved it. And, and then I went on one of these junior year abroad study programs, and I was in Paris. And I just met at a bar a, a group of painters who were Swedish. And they took me on. They were old. I thought they were very old. They were probably 25. But to me, I was 18, so they were very old. And they loved the movies. Uh, and they took me to a theater in Paris that showed, uh, it was called the Cinémathèque Française, and it was programmed in a way I'd never heard of. They would show films either by country or by director, and it was a, really an education in film, and it was the first time I ever heard the word film use rather than movie. And we're talking so long ago for you, because you're so young. This is 1955. Yeah. And there weren't any women making movies. So anyway, I, I just fell in love with making movies, but I didn't think that I would be doing it because it just seemed so out of reach, impossible. And then I graduated and I went to acting school and then I didn't stick that out. And I, oh God, I'd wanted to be telling my life story to get to this. I started my own business because I didn't, I didn't want to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And my hopes of becoming an actress fizzled. I realized I wouldn't want to do that. And I started my own with a partner. We said, well, let's start our own business. You know, and we, we decided we'd open a, uh, which was very novel. When I say coffee shop, I don't mean a, a Starbucks type place. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were rather pretentious. We said, we'll have copying how it is in Europe. We'll have wooden racks with the newspapers. It'll be a very intellectual sort of place. And I started showing movies on Monday nights. And I just became, I said, yeah, I'm going to have to try this somehow or the other. I had no idea. So I sold half of my share of the business to my partner. Um, and I, I had no idea what, what to do because, as I said, First of all, it never occurred to me to go to Hollywood because there weren't any women directors that I heard of. Uh, and in fact, I'll go sideways. People didn't really write about women directors mm -hmm. until the, more like the 1990s. 
And then suddenly there was all, all these books about women were directing in the 20s, the 30s, until the 40s when Hollywood became very corporate. And they were gone, but nobody, it, I didn't know about it. And so that's how I started. <laughs> that's the first question. My God, what else do you have here? <laughs> how did you get started in filmmaking? As I said, I, I, again, I think it's traditional. I had a list of names of people. Well, actually, the first thing I did is I went to Paris because I loved being there that, that year abroad. And I went, I had the names of about three or four French producers. And there was no email, but I was told that they would welcome interviewing me. So I went, and the first guy, after five minutes, reached from my breast, mm -hmm. and I left. Then the second guy reached from my rear, and I left. And I realized, I, I'm not, also, I, I didn't have any friends there anymore, and I didn't have a host. I was all on my own. It was a miserable experience. So I went back to New York where I had a long list of, I tried, at that time there was only three television networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. And I went knocking on those doors and there was, they looked at me like I was crazy. What do you mean you want to be a director? You know, if you're lucky, you'll be a secretary to a producer and maybe he'll let you on a stage, you know, uh, so finally, after about three months of living on friends' couches, ready to give up, I got a job miraculously with a documentary film company. And and that was where my first job was. Would you like me to just go on and on and on? <laughs> just like it. Yes? Yeah. What is an experience throughout your career that you have the fondest memories of? Oh. Uh, well, they, they're separate uh, categories. I love collaborating with my husband on a script for a film I did called Smooth Talk. And that was a very happy time, just making things up together. Uh, uh, he he was more the writer, but we would uh, we would outline scenes on little, and then he'd write it down on little three by five cards. Please remember, this is pre computer. This is yeah. nineteen eighty four. So we, we would tack up on the wall scenes and try to see, well, where would they go? Um, and then I would leave and he would be in his study and he would actually write out the scenes and come and read them to me. Anyway, that was extremely happy. The other happy times of working with particular actors who are just, you feel your life is enlarged, like Laura Dern or I can name others. They're just... That collaboration is the happiest time. When it's going well, it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely see that because um, I'm involved in my high school theater program, right? Okay. Um, and so it's always it's always fun to work with people who share the same interests as you, I feel, you know? So that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, and then somebody has an idea and you build on that idea mm -hmm. and you just say, oh, this is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, when you first started directing, how did you feel? What were your emotions and thoughts at the time? Was it as you had hoped for or expected? Well, I first did, directed documentary films, which is a very different experience because... Yeah. The documentary is you're following the action. You're not creating the set. You're not. You choose what to film, but once once things once you arrive at the place you're filming, you're just lucky to get all the right material. But with with a fiction film, you create everything. There's nothing there that you haven't chosen to be there. Either you built the set, or you chose the costume, or the first day, I was terrified really frightened. I had all these people, film crew, of, I don't know how many people on the crew, 50, 100, I really don't remember, but the electrical department, the prop department, the costume department, when you think about all that. Uh, and I was just very frightened because I had never done that before. And there's no way to prepare for it. Uh, but after a few days, I began to relax. 
and be actually say, I am I like this, <laughs> you know. Uh, and the actors were very helpful. They, they, they knew it was my first film, but they, they were also just very warm hearted. Yeah. Um, since most people were so hostile towards women in the film industry, were there ever times when you considered quitting filmmaking and how did you deal with that? Yes. At the time? Yeah. Oh, well, I had a pretty hard time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Well, this film that I refer to, Smooth Talk, was Laura Dern. She was 17, I guess. It was critically, a, you couldn't dream up better reviews in the New York Times, the Los Angeles, all, in, all over the country. There were hardly any negative reviews. And so I would, I got, as soon as it opened up, I started getting phone calls. I got a call from Steven Spielberg's office. And the list goes on. Diane Keaton, James Brooke. I mean, it was just everybody wanted to meet me, work with me. So I flew out to Hollywood and I got an agent. And I made a big mistake. I should have pursued my own films, but I was just, well, first of all, my husband and I were dead broke because I didn't get really much of any salary doing smooth talk. And that was a whole year. And we took out an, an extra mortgage, if you all know what a mortgage is. <laughs> yeah. But uh, to, just to support ourselves. And then our daughter was going to go to a private high school suddenly. And God, so I took a job directing a big feature film in Hollywood. And that was just disastrously. And then I, I had a producer who was just very hard to deal with and basically stood over my shoulder and then finally fired me after a month, which seems yeah. crazy, which shot half the film. And then I got involved with, with a, the most wonderful actress who had also called me after the smooth stroke opened, Diane Keaton, who wanted me to direct a Larry McMurtry novel which I turned down. Can't believe I'm saying I turned it down. <laughs> and then she came to me. It didn't go well. Anyway, after my experiences with both producer Sidney Pollack and Diane, I never wanted to make another film again. And I didn't for almost two years. I didn't try to write a script. I didn't try to do anything. And luckily my husband was able to keep writing and brought in enough money. Uh, and then a friend of his, really, I didn't know very well, called me up and said, would you direct a film that I'm a, he was a Hollywood producer of, well, you should, until 2000, all the major networks and even some of the uh, cables by then were doing what they called movies of the week. Uh, they were full of feature films. They were on regularly Sunday and Wednesday nights for years and years and years. So there's a whole industry making these films. With, and actors at that point sort of thought it was déclassé to do a movie of the week. And I had hardly ever seen any. And then I found out that out of the thousands that had been made, only 10 had been directed by a woman. And she had directed five of them. And at first, when my friend asked me, oh, he also told me that by now I directed two feature films uh, that CBS would only approve me. They were very nervous about a woman directing uh, if my friend Robert would step in and take over if I failed. So I, I hesitated for a while, and I finally decided I would try it. And it was a happy experience. I worked with this... Uh, you know an actress named Helen Hunt? I think so, yeah. Yeah, she was in a series. Oh, God, it was, I can't remember the name now. This is before she had a big hit series. Then won the Academy Award for a film she did with Jack Nicholson. I can't remember the titles of any of these. Anyway, I were, that was a fine experience. And I so I then wound up doing uh, television movies for more than 10 years and had some good experiences. Yeah. Um, so despite 
having a child, you still managed to find time to dedicate to directing. How did you balance motherhood with your career? My husband, he died a little while ago, was a writer. So he didn't go to any place. He could be available to take care of our daughter, Sarah, when I wasn't around. And then they would, I was editing for those that decade or so that I was doing these movies for television. I, we moved to LA. So they were right there on the, you know, I could see them at night. I could see them. Well, I'd go away to sh shoot a film, but come back to LA and edit in LA. And so I was very fortunate to have a husband who had that kind of job. Yeah. So <laughs> not many people do, you know, although now more and more people work from home. So I hope that can change for people. Yeah, which I'm sure that's um, nice now that people are, you know, able to work from home because it could allow for more people to have more opportunities to follow their craft like you were able to, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you mentioned throughout your book that you struggled with anxiety, um, yet the decisions you made throughout your career were quite courageous. What advice do you have for overcoming your fears in order to achieve your dreams? Uh, anxiety is not to be confused with fear. Mm. Uh, anxiety attacks, I, I don't know if you, I hope you've never had one. <laughs> I have, unfortunately. Um, but you know the feeling is you just want to escape, yeah. flee. You think yeah. you can't stand being there another second. Uh, mm. I started having them. When I look back, it's not surprising. I went to a very good acting school in New York after I graduated from college. And I, after being away for, well, I guess, four years and then living in Paris for a year, I was I had to live with my parents, who I, was, who I loved. But they were way out at the end of Brooklyn, Coney Island. It was an hour by train. And the train, the subway, always got stuck. And, and you'd sit there in the dark. And you never knew when you were going to be able to leave. And I began to develop these severe anxiety attacks. And that's really why I left acting school is, uh, well, as a combination, I realized I wouldn't be able to survive going to auditions. I, the idea of it just seemed dreadful, but I couldn't stand being any place. And then it, they started again in my later 20s after I divorced uh, my first husband. I was on my own, and they started up again. I was afraid to leave my apartment. And the solution came. The man I eventually married and was married to for almost 40 years, the writer, Tom Cole, I had never told anybody about the anxiety attacks. I was so ashamed of them. I didn't know that anybody else in the whole wide world had them. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, and he said to me, well, the first thing is, a lot of people have it, but why don't you see a psychiatrist? And I didn't know anybody who's seen a psychiatrist. So I started going, uh, uh, and that was extremely helpful. Uh, and I learned how to recognize when they were coming and what they were about and what caused them, and I could slowly talk myself out of it. Mm. And I've been very fortunate. I. I only had it once after that when a really mean producer, I, I was directing a, a law and order show. It was just terrible. I actually had a full-blown anxiety attack, uh, but it was only th that day. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry you have them. Oh, it's, it's, it's all right. <laughs> I think every, everybody has them. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. It's so strange. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel like anxiety is so common. Um, and no one really talks about it. Thankfully, mental health is becoming more of a topic that yes, people are yes. willing to talk about, and therapy is becoming more normalized. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm sorry you had to deal with anxiety attacks. Oh, well. it was because, it, while I was going yeah. through it. I wanted. I, uh, well, I could tell you what I learned, but it's it's maybe just was worked for me. This doctor said to me one day, after listening to my saying, oh, I was anxious, I was anxious, he mm -hmm. said, well, uh, is it possible that you, would that you would rather be anxious than 
let yourself feel what you really are feeling at that moment. I said, are you crazy? I'd rather kill myself yeah. than, than have an anxiety attack. What are you talking about? And he was quite right. I was all, most of the time, I was just angry or didn't want to be there. It was a whole bunch of stuff. And I just couldn't face up to feeling that. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if I was angry with somebody I loved. I loved my parents. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to acknowledge that I hated being at home. <laughs> yeah. Hate is too strong a word. It just wasn't working yeah. out for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's just constraining. <laughs> yeah, I felt like I was going backwards in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. In your book, you are very critical of several titans in the Hollywood industry, including um, Harvey Weinstein and Sidney Pollack. Um, why did you choose to write about these encounters and what did they teach you? Well, was... Sidney Pollack made, was at that time, was actually the king of Hollywood. He'd made so many successful commercial films. And he was the producer of this film, Bright Lights, Big City. And we were getting along fine. My husband was writing the script. And we were in what's called pre-production, when you're getting ready, when you're actually finally picking the sets. And you know, you 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 said, go, we're we're going now. And he called me into his office one day and without any preamble said, You gotta fire your cameraman. What? First of all, it's my prerogative as the director, especially with the union to back me, that I can hire anybody I want. And he was so abrupt and so, and I suddenly realized, my God, this is, I want to keep the man who filmed Smooth Talk, which brought me such success. Maybe he's never, and, and, and the cameraman, Mr. Jim Glennon, got such praise for his camera work. And I, I thought, I didn't, I should have, I said no. And what was your question? I'm getting lost in my story. Oh, sorry. Um, why did you choose to write about these encounters? And uh, because what of what I, what I learned from that is I had no experience with anybody bullying me. Mm -hmm. It hadn't happened. I'd made documentary films, never happens there. My first film, I was the co-producer of Smooth Talk. Uh, I, I had optioned the film rights to a short story is based on this. I was, as I say, out of my depth so completely. And what I learned over the years, and it took me quite a while, is uh, producers can feel or feel very empowered. And what I learned to do is to, I should have said to Mr. Pollock, oh, Sydney, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Let's talk about it. You know, what is it that's bothering you? He would say, blah, blah, blah. And I say, but I've had the opposite experience, you know, and he, he he supports me in everything I do. But I just got, you know. And that's the big lesson for me. And that's why I wrote about it. It also was awful. He was the epitome of the bully in Hollywood. Mm. Was I'm sure, especially since... Um... Hollywood wasn't and still isn't very accepting of no. female directors that it can be even worse for um, women directing. Um, what advice do you have for those who have been told by other people that they can't ach achieve their goals? Keep going. I think I end my book that way. I think I, I haven't heard it in a little while, but I think that it was hard to end a book about your, you know, your life because your life is still ongoing, and how do you, mm -hmm. how do you, you can't really wrap it up. So I think I ended it with, I guess, something like, just keep going. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what else. I didn't want to do anything else but make movies, <laughs> so I kept going. Mm -hmm. um, have conditions, in your opinion, improved for women in Hollywood? What has changed following the Me Too movement? A lot's changed. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much in features, but when I direct, okay, in the early, let's say 2003, four, five, I don't remember the days, I directed some episodic television. Uh, but the first 
time. The first episodic TV I did was a, a Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And at that point, it was in its fourth season. I mean, already, and that means, I don't know, 20 episodes a season. They had hired only two women in those four years. And they never hired those women a second time. They said they weren't very good. Mm. And I had a hard time with that show. And in the last two years, the statistics are remarkable. Something like 40% of people since the Me Too are women who are directing episodic television. It's, I couldn't have imagined it. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll translate into studios giving them jobs as directors because much more money is involved. And it always does come down to that. But yes, I'm very happy about that. Um, what do you hope to see Hollywood do in the future regarding women in the industry? Oh, it's not just women. I just mm -hmm. wish they'd be more open to yeah. films of I mean, right now, everything is blockbusters for almost everything. Uh, there are very few what I would call films about people, <laughs> you know, which are. And so I just, I, I certainly hope more. I'm sure it's going to happen that more and more women will be. I, I get notice every, I guess, every week of what I'm part of a union called the Directors Guild of America. And they have a beautiful theater, both theaters, one in New York and one in Los Angeles. And if I lived in those cities, I'd be able to go and see all the movies being released in these beautiful theaters. Anyway, I get a list of those films that are being shown that week. And I keep looking and it hardly ever changes out of 10 films. Well, it used to be none. Then it was maybe one was directed by a woman. I'm hoping it will even out. And when it does, it'll be the kind of stories I might want to see. But I like all kinds of films. Yeah, I can't just say I my favorite films. They're just too many. Yeah. <laughs> what's your, this wasn't one of my questions, but what's your favorite type, like genre of film or era? I don't have one. You don't I have really one? Don't. Yeah. No, I don't. I like, it depends on. Your mood, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. I, I don't go for horror films. I have to say mm -hmm. that. I was laughing though. Uh, I watch a network called Turner Classic Movies, mm -hmm. and I I will watch it for like twenty minutes here and there if I'm eating on my own, and I'll turn it on the TV in the kitchen. And they were showing The Bride of Frankenstein, which I had never seen, mm -hmm. and it's so wonderful to see it. Um, it's hardly scary. I certainly, I'm sure I would have been terrified as a kid. Uh, but no, I, I, I can't. I can't tell you mm -hmm. my favorites. I could tell you films I've liked in the last year or two, but that's actually I haven't seen that many films in the last year or two. I haven't gone to a movie. I've only yeah. been to a movie theater twice. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah. like with COVID, that happened to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, for me. It was, I hadn't gone to a theater in almost like three years. Same with me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then this year I went a whole bunch. I was like, oh, I, I missed out on this for so many years, you know? Yeah. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so in your book, you also write about your time serving as a volunteer mentor for aspiring filmmakers. What was that experience like? Uh, each each one is a different experience depending on the people I'm with. But my favorite, well, this is I I I feel lucky that at a time when I shouldn't be making movies, I I got involved with this group called By Kids B Y K I D S, and the uh, they they basically seduce people like me to work for nothing to to uh, mentor young kids who have stories to tell with a camera. And I, I love doing it. I, and I've traveled in many places with this. I went to India first and worked with the, uh, young girls who the first in their family to ever be educated. 
I went to Nicaragua after that uh, and filmed a young girl whose parents own a small coffee farm that they grow coffee beans. Mm -hmm. And there been the climate change has so drastically affected uh, the coffee crops that they, they're hard. I don't know how they're going to survive. And I did another film with a girl with cerebral palsy who lives in Baltimore. A terrific young woman. But it's important. These films are all shown on public television stations. Mm -hmm. And then they have a wide distribution to schools. So I'm very happy doing that right now. I feel it's a privilege. And then I wrote the book during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the pandemic, I feel like, gave a lot of people time to really do things that they've been wanting to do. I mean, for me, it was my blog, right? For you, it's yeah. your book. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm happy to help you. I think what you're doing is great. Thank you so much. That means a lot. <laughs> yeah, really. It's great to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I mean, I started, I was 20 when I started mm -hmm. that club for music. Mm -hmm. I just didn't think I couldn't. So mm -hmm. we did it. You know, yeah. I, it didn't even occur to me to not try. Mm -hmm. It wasn't movies. It was something completely yeah. different. <laughs> but the friendly guys at the hardware store taught me how to paint. And I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. so here you are blogging and podcasting. <laughs> bravo. Bravo to you. Thank you so much. It, it really means a lot. Good, carry on. And that is the end of my interview with Joyce Chopra. Thank you so, so much, Joyce, for coming on the podcast. It really means a lot. Thank you for everyone who has been here for 50 episodes. Um, ignore my face. <laughs> it's my first time, you know. Um, it's very weird having to look at a camera and not just being able to talk. And um, like I said, hopefully I can do more videos with my face in them more episodes you know with my face in them and maybe i'll make my youtube more of a mix between a booktube and uh my podcast i'll definitely still be posting my episodes on here but i definitely think having my own little movie and book review things where i need visuals right i can expand that into my youtube channel now which will be fun i'm excited we'll see we'll see how well that goes let's see how well i manage my time before i commit to anything <laughs> it's it's not for sure <laughs> we'll see um but yeah i hope you enjoyed this episode and if you did please follow wherever you are listening if you can leave a rating please do if you can leave a review please do that would be amazing and really help me out um, recommend this podcast to your friends. Um, if you want to read more of my book reviews, please check out my blog, Maya's Reviews, at mayagreviews.wordpress.com. You can also find me at Maya the Bookworm on Twitter, Goodreads, BookBub, and Book Sirens. It's very stressful trying to remember all this. I'm, I usually could read it off. <laughs> Um, I'm also on Tumblr at Maya Reviews. If you want me to review your book or come on the podcast to chat, maybe, you know, just reach out to me. You can email me at mayagbookreviews at gmail.com. I believe that is correct. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, mayagbookreviews at gmail.com. But I do ask that if you are reaching out in regards to a review request, interview, collab, anything publicity related, that you check out my publicity request page first and then email me. I hope this was a good episode for you guys. Please go pre-order Joyce Chopra's um, memoir, Lady Director, coming out November 22nd, 2022. And um, yeah, thank you so much for listening. And... Happy reading, happy watching, happy listening, happy watching. That's, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't know how much I like this. You guys can see my face and that's kind of weird. But have a good day, everyone. And thank you so much for sticking around for 50 episodes. It's insane to me that I'm still making these. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much and have a great day.